Welcome to the Erotic Heritage Museum in fabulous Las Vegas. Come on in. Expose life shows females on poles. Down on the strip, got to stay up on your toes. You know how we do it, play your LV role. You know how we do it, play your LV role. Expose. LV Expose. Expose. LV Expose. Hi, I'm Julian Gray, host of Expose Las Vegas. Today we are here with Dr. Victoria Hartman, the director of the Erotic Heritage Museum. Dr. Victoria, welcome. Thank you. Now, I was doing a little research online before we came in today, and the Erotic Heritage Museum has a pretty interesting history. Could you tell us a little bit about what this place is all about? Absolutely. Uh, well, the Erotic Heritage Museum is actually a, a project that was put together by Harry Moni, who is the founder of the Deja Vu Gentlemen's Club chain, and Dr. Ted McElvena, who is the president of the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. They met actually back way in the 70s during the heyday of the adult film industry and came together both as advocates of uh, the freedom to choose what we want to view and they maintained a very long relationship and then in 2006 around there they decided that they had so much in terms of a collection each of them of erotic materials uh, that they decided they wanted to put a museum together and they opened up the erotic heritage museum in 2008. wow and how long have you been here uh, I came here actually as an intern uh, when I started my PhD program in 2010 and I became the director in April of 2014. Wow, and, and like I was telling you earlier, I, as a Las Vegas local I drive by here all the time mm -hmm. and I'd never come in here but now I come in here and I'm amazed at the vast amount of history and areas there is that you guys cover. So is Las Vegas a good city for this museum you think? You know, uh People come to Las Vegas to be entertained, but they also, the culture here is very different from anywhere in the United States or in, in the world, actually. And I think Vegas is a perfect place for this museum because we are kind of an embodiment of Las Vegas. We're educational, but we're also entertaining. So people come here and they spend hours here and are really amazed at what they find here. Um, you know, we have everything from entertainment shows to uh, theater exhibits to educational exhibits and a whole plethora of things in between. So there's a lot to see here and a lot to do here. You can come and, and read and have coffee and just hang out. It's a great place to hang out for the day. Absolutely, well, I'm excited for you to show us around and I'm excited to check out what's next. I'd love to. Awesome. Hey, Dr. Victoria, we're here at our first stop, the Wall of Shame, and I couldn't help but view a few familiar faces. Could you tell us about this exhibit? Absolutely. So here at the Erotic Heritage Museum, we uh, are feel very strongly about exposing hypocrisy in politics and in religion around sexual issues, as well as um, the repressive laws that come from those you know, agencies. And the Wall of Shame is meant to do just that. It's meant to expose those hypocrisies, and especially those who make those laws, how oftentimes what they're telling us on TV and in their newsreels and whatnot, and as they're out on the road, uh, that they're not necessarily living by the laws that they're passing for the rest of us. And that's what this, this exhibit is meant to expose. Politicians, religious individuals, so that so that people can understand that just because someone is telling them something, they may not have to believe it or even more so internalize it where it comes to their own sexuality. This is the fifth in exhibit and this exhibit is really, really interesting because well, the history of the Fithian exhibit is uh, Marilyn Fithian was a sex researcher mm -hmm. around the same time as Dr. Kinsey was. And uh, while she was practicing, she and her partner traveled the world and collected really ancient artifacts of a sexual nature. And a lot of people think, well, sexuality is you know, not something that um, was really paid attention to in 1500 BC or 2000 BC, but in fact, it permeated a lot of ancient cultures. So as we're looking at this collection, it's obvious that these things are dated back centuries ago. Yeah. Um, how come we're not learning about this type of history in our history books, you think, in our modern culture? Well, I think we're really busy and we're so caught up in our daily lives that we don't have a lot of time to think about how did ancient cultures express themselves sexually. Luckily, there are shows such as yours and others that 
bring attention to these things and give people an opportunity to think and expose themselves to other cultures and how they, they interacted sexually with one another. I look forward to looking around here and already I've learned so much. I can't wait to check out the next exhibit. Well, let's go. All right, awesome. Okay, Dr. Victoria, we're here at the next exhibit and I'm a huge Star Wars <laughs> fan, so I couldn't help but notice what we have going on here. What, explain to me the Star Wars section of the museum. Okay, well, these artifacts are from the Star Wars uh, adult parody. Um, and one, a lot of the things that people don't know about the adult industry is it's changed over the course of its lifetime. And a few years ago, it started going into parodying mainstream films and trying to meet the same budgetary requirements of them so that they are legit and they look professionally made. These pieces were made specifically for the Star Wars adult film parody. A real speeder and real troopers. And, you know, so they really try to reproduce what the mainstream filmmakers are doing. Okay, Dr. Victoria, so now we're here at the German portion of the museum. And I know you yourself have some German roots, so I'm yes, curious to get your take on what we're seeing here. Well, this is our German art exhibit. In particular, it's meant to represent the art that was lost when Hitler entered Berlin in 1933. The Hirschfeld Institute was one of the founding institutions of human sexual uh, study. And uh, Hitler, although he was pro-reproduction because he needed soldiers, he was anti-sex. And he sent, uh, on order, he sent his troops in to uh, Berlin to burn the Hirschfeld Institute. That was one of the first places that he had destroyed. The art, the uh, academic work, the anything that had to do with sexuality, the artifacts, he tried to destroy them all. And these are reproductions of some of the pieces that were saved um, by people who got to it before the fire consumed it. Uh, so it's a very, it's very important history and also a great example of what, and we're seeing that now over in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, it's really important to hold on to history, especially our sexual history, because we learn from it. And it's not something to be frightened of, but those in power, because they're trying to advance their own agenda, will do everything they can to destroy it. And you were telling me earlier that the American perspective and the European German maybe perspective of sexuality is not exactly the same thing. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, they're not. You know, the European views on sexuality, at least where I grew up in, in Germany, uh, sexuality is a non-issue. It's not something that we struggle with. We have open and frank conversations about it in junior high and younger. Uh, comprehensive sex education is very prominent there. And depictions of healthy sexuality permeate the culture. Uh, whereas here in the States, there's sort of a, a love-hate relationship with sexuality. Um, and a lot of people attribute that to, well, we were founded by the Puritans and so forth, and English when they came over here who had repressive, se more, repressive sexual mores during the Victorian era. So uh, there is a, 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 a contrast between the way that we deal with sexuality here in the United States and the way that Europe deals with sexuality. And part of our goal here at the museum is to uh, bring some of that temperament around sexuality to the states and uh, again to communicate that who we are as sexual beings is, is perfectly okay as long as everyone is aware and consenting to it. That was a great history lesson. I definitely did not know that. <laughs> um, I'm, it's a surprise at each corner we're turning here. Yes. So. Well, there's stuff upstairs, so maybe we should head up there. Upstairs? There's yeah. more. Oh yeah, we're two floors. <laughs> 24,000 square feet. We're the biggest erotic museum in the entire world. Wow, well we're so lucky to be here. Let's go check out some more. All right, awesome. Okay, Dr. Victoria, we're now upstairs. We made it upstairs. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> yes. And we're in the goddess exhibit. Yes. Now that name already sounds interesting. So what do we have going on here? So this is actually one of my favorite places in the museum on the second floor, the goddess exhibit. And the story, this is a big exhibit and it's not all of it. The, the collection actually spans uh, much more, it's just we didn't have the room to bring in here. And in a 24,000 square foot museum, you can imagine how big that exhibit is to not fit everything. Right. This collection was actually put together by one of the most romantic couples I've ever met. Uh, they met years and years ago, never married, and their relationship centered around traveling around the world and collecting erotic items all over the world. And I've been to their home, and, and the, the gentleman of the couple has painting upon painting of his 
partner on the walls in various stages of undress. And when they contacted us, he had actually suffered a stroke and they wanted to open their own gallery, but they couldn't because of his illness. So they said, you know, we'd really love to have our pieces be in the museum available to people as an expression of you know, our love. And, uh, and so uh, we selected certain pieces and we brought them in and we try to figure out how would we, what would we name this exhibit. Given how much he worships her, we said, well, it can only be the goddess exhibit. And one of the other things that makes this collection really interesting is it's the only one in the museum where you can buy pieces and take uh -huh. the Erotic Heritage Museum and this wonderful love story home with you. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So all of this is based upon one couple? One couple. Wow. Yeah. And their world travel celebrating their love for each other. And it's beautiful. The pieces are beautiful and they celebrate, you know, sexual love and femininity. It's just, it's one of my favorite collections here in the museum on the upstairs level. So definitely a place maybe a, a happy couple could come and probably relate to, I imagine. Valentine's Day, holidays, you know, anywhere where couples want to come. And this is, it's April and we're actually celebrating Spring is for Lovers. So the people that come here, the couples that come here, they get in for one price. They get in two for one. And uh, we really want to encourage couples to come here because it's not just about titillation here. It's also about celebrating love and sexuality in a more gentle way. I think you just inspired my next date. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Dr. Victoria, uh, we've come to a, looks like a pretty interesting section behind us. Mm -hmm. I believe this is the BDSM section of the museum. Right. What do we have going on back here? Well, this is a, uh, uh, an exhibit that was put together by the local BDSM community. And for people that don't know what BDSM is, although there has been some exposure to alternative lifestyles in the media lately with uh, the release of certain films and whatnot, BDSM stands for Bondage Discipline Sadomasochism. It's a variant of sexuality where people engage in power play. And that can involve being tied up, so rope work, it can be involved spanking, um, uh, collaring, master-slave relationships. It's a whole universe onto itself and how people relate to each other sexually. Sometimes sexual activity itself isn't even involved in the activity. They enjoy being tied up exclusively and the sexual activity may, become, may come before or afterwards. Uh, or restraint or what have you, you know, it's, it's, it's a big topic and I don't know that we have the time to go into it during, you know, our time together, uh, but it's, it's, it's become more mainstream with um, books that have been published and films that have been released, uh, but it's, it's a whole world unto itself. And it seems from talks I've had with people, it's the, the people that are involved in it take it very, very seriously. Like it's they not, do. They don't like it to be joked about. So it's right, very... they do, and in particular because consent and communication is so important. When you're dealing with power play dynamics and sexual relating, um, there's the potential for harm. So it's really important. For, for people to have an open dialogue about what their needs are, what their desires are, what their limitations are. And the BDSM community is very big on making sure that those elements are in place before any kind of intimate activity happens. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know we have several things behind us, but could you maybe elaborate? on a couple of the pieces I'm seeing here. Sure, well these pieces here, the, the, this is suspension and rope work, so it's a combination of the two. Um, and it's meant, to, it, it kind of takes people into a different place emotionally and mentally, uh, being restrained in this way. They, they relinquish their power to the person who's restraining them or suspending them. And it's a very intimate scene, they're called scenes. Um, another one of course is the restraint. Uh, there's more rope work over here, more restraint in the back, and this is a very small sampling of what in fact people do in the BDSM community when they're intimate with one another. So this is a very small example. And so basically what I'm getting from you, so as much as it may look physically involved, there's just as much mentally oh, it's almost, to be involved. It's, I would, well. There could be an argument that it's much more mental than physical. The physical is just a manifestation of the intense mental connection that people have when they're engaging in BDSM play. Victoria, this tour has been amazing. I've learned so much and you've been great so far. Thank you. Uh, I, I noticed over there, I couldn't help uh, peep boots. Mm -hmm. 
What, what is a peep booth? Well, uh, actually, peep booths have a long history. They used to carry the dressed ladies, but risque dressed hmm. ladies, in um, cart cartons or um, boxes, actually, with sliding windows in them, and they would you know, pay their toll or their tax to the person that was carrying or the people that were carrying the, the boxes around and they would peep into the the booth where the little girl was, at, where the, the woman was at. Um, and then it just carried forward from there where you had, uh, in the during the Victorian era, you had separated booths mm -hmm. made from glass and wood and they would slide dollars through the wooden slot so that the young woman on the other side would dance for them and whatnot. And then it was like, it started to take on a show quality where they'd use feather boas and they'd be dressed in very elaborate and lacy um, uh, lingerie and so forth. And then of course today, a lot of times you'll find in the adult bookstores, uh, booths where people can watch adult films either alone or together. Uh, and you know, if they don't have access to you know watching adult material in the privacy of their own home, then they can go to these places and watch whatever latest adult film has come out. Mm -hmm. So is that where the term peep show came from? Exactly. Was from the peep booths? The peep, the ancient peep booths where they would peep through the windows. Yeah, in fact. Wow. Yeah. And I noticed too, you guys looks like a movie theater next to the we peep do. Booth. Oh, I'm Tell so glad that. that you brought up the theater. So. Back, a lot of people don't remember this, especially the you know, the millennial generation. But back in the '70s was sort of the heyday of the adult theater, especially in New York. And celebrities would go to these these grand openings of adult uh, movies. Um, but over time, you know, with um, the Mies Commission and and so forth, and laws that came into place where you couldn't uh, exhibit materials like that in a public forum, and we went to VCRs. There are very few adult theaters left in the United States, and one is located in Portland, Oregon, and it's called the Paris Theater, and it's been around for 40 or 50 years. And uh, we named our theater, we have a mock-up theater with 30 seats in it with a big screen. We named it the Paris Theater in honor of the theater that still exists in Portland, Oregon. And we have Friday night showings where people come in and watch like the new movies that are out, and sometimes we, watch, we have um, underground movies that we watch there of an adult nature. So, you know, we, we try to um, remind people of where the adult industry used to find itself back in the 70s when these were being released to the mainstream in theaters. Uh, so some of the classics. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I understand you also teach classes here. Or could you a little more about that? We do. Uh, we teach a whole host of different classes here at the museum. And because of the fact that we are an educational facility, we also have live demonstrations of some of the things we teach. Um, one of our most popular ones is the art of oral pleasures. A lot of people struggle with pleasing each other orally. They don't know how to, how do you approach someone and have this conversation and whatnot. And the class um, teaches communication, sexual communication. It teaches uh, safety around um, sexually transmitted infections and a little bit of history of oral pleasing one another and then at the end of the class we then have a live demonstration so a lot of people well we, they can learn it in a class and they can read it in a book but unless they see it firsthand you know and it's a re really great way to learn firsthand how to please your your lover in this way right and so it seems like to encapsulate everything it seems like you know this is the stuff you guys have here is stuff people are going to look on the internet or try to find on their own anyway. Right. You guys are presenting it in a safe, right, correct way. Exactly, way and we it. teach consent and so forth. Adult material has its place, and we like to think that we take it a step further and demystify sexual activity and bring it into much more of a human realm and teach proper technique and how to relate to one another on an intimate level because ultimately when we connect with someone it's about being intimate with someone and that's a, a, a much deeper way of relating than just say you know um, having sex it's different so if someone wanted to attend one of these classes to learn more about what you guys have to offer mm -hmm. here how would they do that well they can call us uh, we have, um, I have staff full time from morning till night. We're open from uh, 11 in the morning until 10 p.m., seven days a week. And uh, also we have a website that has our calendar and we're very active on, on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. 
and uh, in social media. So we're constantly posting, you know, the new things that are happening at the museum. So there's a lot of different ways for people to find out what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Victoria. And I look forward to seeing a little more of the museum here and uh, as we finish up. Well, let's go look. Awesome. <laughs> Dr. Victoria, thank you so much for the tour today. I learned so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for coming and visiting. Absolutely, and this will be a for sure place I recommend to all my friends the next time they ask me what to do in Las Vegas. We'd love to have you. And for all you watching, be sure to visit the Erotic Heritage Museum on your next trip to Las Vegas, to Nevada, and become a member today. I'm Julian Gray of Exposed Las Vegas. See you next time. Exposed life shows females on poles Down on the strip, got to stay up on your toes You know how we do it, play your LV role You know how we do it, play your LV role Exposed LV Exposed Exposed